after I got my first class divers rating, I, I got aboard another ship. Uh, it's a, still is an APA, just like the buoy, and uh, we went to, uh, picked up sailors in. Uh, I mean, uh, picked up Marines in in uh, uh, Saipan. And uh, we brought them on over to Okinawa, and we picked up some more Marines. And that's when the bad storm hit, you know, the typhoon that damaged many ships. And I had a friend on the USS San Diego, and it almost sunk it, but it was a big, heavy, you know, it was a light cruiser, you know. And, uh, but uh, it did a lot of damage uh, and, and sunk a lot of ships and killed a lot of sailors that typhoon did. And uh, at the same time that uh, uh, Mr. Uh, McClure was there, you know, in Okinawa at that time preparing to jump. And uh, so uh, we took the first, uh, the, they dropped the atomic bomb. The, about a week before they dropped the atomic bomb was when this bad typhoon hit. And so we picked the Marines up there on Okinawa, and, and uh, about a week after they dropped the atomic bomb in Nagasaki, we went right through the Straits of Nagasaki, right on into Sasebo, which is uh, one of the largest naval ports in the world. And uh, so we uh, had a lot of experiences there in uh, in Sasebo, and then. This was before peace was signed on the Missouri, and uh, so then then we uh, came back to the Philippines, and uh, so the uh, we we were in the Cavite naval base there uh, in the Philippines, and uh, so we had to get off of the ship and. Uh, I don't know why, but uh, we, we were billeted in the, uh, they, they had tents for us to sleep in. Of course, we had to sleep under uh, nets because the mosquitoes are so thick and strong there at night that they just about big enough to carry you away. <laughs> so then for some reason, I don't know why we had, to, oh yeah, was probably, we had leave, that's the reason we had. Uh, we was off the ship there for a while. We'd go over to Manila and catch uh, the Liberty boats and go to Manila. And then finally we went back aboard. Uh, I left that ship and uh, we was on a, a big old LST and came back to Hawaii. Uh -huh. And uh, so that was the third time I was in Hawaii <laughs> and, and uh, left that. LST and uh, and caught a, another troop, troop transport on to uh, 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 not Los Angeles, but uh, uh, California. I can't even think of the name of the town. It's a city there, huh? like San Francisco. San Francisco. We came into San Francisco right through the. Uh, the uh, Golden Gate Bridge mm -hmm. and, and uh, Alcatraz is there, the Isle Island, you know, out there, out of, yeah. off of uh, San Francisco. And we were there for a while, and then I got a, a ship into Camp Shelby, Virginia, uh, who got a, a train to Camp Shelby, mm -hmm. and that's where I was discharged. Came home, and uh, so that that ended my naval that career. Ended your naval career. I almost uh, shipped over. I kind of times uh, I wished I had shipped over and stayed in the navy. I liked the navy, but if I had, I'd never met Evelyn, would I? Yeah, so, that'd have been bad. <laughs> okay, now we can cut it off. And, until we figure out how to do that one, then we'll uh, take the girls. Uh, well, I had a lot of good experiences in Ireland, and uh, uh, we met uh, some of my relations there, you know, and uh, 
uh, I, I uh, always had to show for the dignitaries when they came because I had the limousine. The skipper always used his limousine, the very best that we had on, on the naval base when we had uh, guests. And so when Bob Hope and Al Jenkins and Al Jolson and Frank McHugh and Patricia Morrison and a lot of the the, the dignitaries were putting on a big show. Uh, I got all their autographs while they were there and chauffeured them around. And then when the Cordell Hull, the Secretary of State, and and uh, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, the vice, the president's wife, came, I chauffeured them, and, and we uh, had the. Uh, our, our men passed in review, you know, and, and, and all for them to uh, inspect the troops, and, mm -hmm. and we did all that. And then uh, the uh, there's a little bit of history back of of uh, uh, Winston Churchill, and he was the first Lord of the Admiralty. And the war, war started, and the Winston went up as Prime Minister, mm -hmm. and of course, him being kin to me <laughs> through uh, my father, my Winston Spencer Churchill was uh, uh, Princeton Dye's. His mother was Princeton Dye's aunt, mm -hmm. and uh, he was a cousin to my grandfather, and uh, so he. Uh, when he went up as Prime Minister, the first Lord of the Admiralty, uh, which he held that position until he went up as Prime Minister, then Sir Harold Bolton, Lord Bolton, took over the uh, position of first Lord of the Admiralty. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he came to inspect the troops, British and America, in, uh, in uh, Ireland. And he was there for nearly a week. And, uh, commanding officer told me, said, now Herb said, I'll take care of my own transportation. Says, you just make sure that they go anywhere they want to go and take them anywhere they want to go and buy them anything they want that the commissaries and charge it to me and, <laughs> and uh, just treat them royally. And, and I did. And, and I took them around showing them the different places, and, which I'd been around the, all, almost a year then in Ireland. And so, uh, uh, I said, Sir Harold, I said, I, uh, my great-grandmother was Elizabeth Bolton from Ireland. And he, he said, well, Elizabeth Bolton said, we'll look that up. And uh, found out that uh, we were kin. And uh, so uh, my father's mother, we were kin to him, and then we mm -hmm. was kin to the Spencers there, too. You know? uh -huh. So he had me over in England. Uh, to uh, the fox hunts, and uh, we had a great time. Uh, I was invited over one weekend, and, and so they wrote mother and dad, told them that they, and, and, uh, they had the connection. Uh -huh. and when I was uh, in England, going regressing back a little bit, uh, I, in 2000, uh, and the Randalls, we were there with them, and. Uh, she got on the uh, internet and mm -hmm. she she looked up uh, my family record and uh -huh. came right on down to Elizabeth Bolton, Is that and right? grandfather, and, uh -huh. and all that. And she she did that while I was there, and uh, we we enjoyed that. But uh, that was that was some experience uh, with them. But uh, I take a lot of the dignitaries friends of his, uh, of the skipper, mm -hmm. and uh, when we'd have parties, and I'd go over to the Irish Free State Line, and we weren't allowed to go past that because any American caught over in Southern Ireland was interned until after the war, because they weren't allowed to go into Southern Ireland. They were neutral, you know. They called herself neutral, but they they kind of leaned toward Hitler, and uh, there's a lot of them, a lot of fifth columnists that slipped over and done damage in, in Ireland, uh, right through the Free State Line, 
and uh, so they were very. Uh, they they had kept a pretty tight rein on on the, the who come across and all that. Mm -hmm. So one time I had picked up some guests at a party and took them back about a midnight, and uh, so I dropped them off at the Free State Line and the taxis picked them up there and took them on wherever they were going over in our Southern Ireland. And uh, so uh, on my way back, the, the two men of the Royal Ulster Constabulary uh, stopped me. And I showed them my ID and, and all. And, and uh, they said, well, we'll have to search the car. I said, no, no. I said, you don't search the commanding officer's car. I said, that's a no-no. <laughs> and uh, so they said, yeah, I said, I'm sorry, we'll have to. Well, one of them was standing back of the back part, back of the back of my car. And the other one was at the door, and he put his hand on the door. I'd already unbuckled the flap on my 45, and I slid it right out, <laughs> throwed it in his face. I said, now, buddy, I says, you want to live, don't you? And he says, sure. Well, I said, well, I said, if you do, you throw that gun as far as you can. Oh, no, I'm not throwing my gun away. I said, you either do that or I'm going to blow your head off. <laughs> so he slung his gun, and I said, tell your buddy to throw his. I said, you guys are not going to shoot me when I drive away from here. <clears throat> So the other one, he threw his gun over into the ditch down there, and it was dark. And I drove away, so I got back to the, to the we were staying at the big mansion uh, about a mile outside of Londonderry, mile and a half. And uh, so uh, I didn't bother the skipper that night. I waited till the next morning, and he came down, and I'd already had my breakfast. And, he came down to get in to leave and, and uh, to go down to the naval base at headquarters. I told him on the way down about about my experience that I'd had the night before with those two men. He laughed. He said, "Well, you did what was right there." So I figured they'd make a report on it. So we hadn't been in there a few minutes in his office. And, and uh, here come the head man from the R Royal uh, Ulster Constabulary had, had had more braid on him than a British admiral, you know. And oh man, he was really haughty and arrogant. And he went in and started in. He said, "You, your men says one of your men says helped two of my men up and made them throw their guns away." And, Skipper said, well, it's a wonder he hadn't shot him. said, that boy, he won't fool with you two minutes. He said, and he'd have been in the right to have done it, too, because said, they're not supposed to. He said, you, you people ought to know you're not supposed to mess with my car. The time the skipper got done chewing him out, he went out of there with the tail between his legs. And <laughs> he gave me a dirty look as he went out the door. I was out in the hallway. And... Uh, so we, we never had no more trouble with the Royal Austin Constabulary from that time on. But the skipper and I, we'd go, uh, if, they, if he didn't have some dignitaries or some uh, high officials or something like that to go golfing with, he loved to golf, so uh, he'd say, Herb, let's go golfing. So uh, I was a left-handed golfer and he got me a set of left-handed clubs. And he and I'd golf together when we didn't, and then when he had uh, the big shots with him, I'd always caddy for him, you know. And uh, so uh, he taught me to golf. And it was quite a great experience, and he was like a father to me. He, uh, old uh, McDonald, he he was. He, he anybody hurt, uh, messed with me, well, I had him <laughs> to deal with. As uh, one of the other episodes that I told you about, uh, but. Uh, he he was really he was really good to me. A lot of times he'd say uh, to his cook and his steward, "Say you all got the evening off." Says I've got only two guests coming, and says Herb's going to do the cooking. So I'd go get 
filet mignons and and uh, he loved Greek salads and uh -huh. uh, and he knew I knew how to fix them and uh, I'd fix lots of things for him you know and uh, so he said Herb will do the cooking so I I did a lot of the a lot of things like that and, and uh, so. He he didn't he didn't want any other driver but me. <laughs> what was his name again, Uncle Herb? McDonald. McDonald. Yeah. Okay. Tell me about um, you mentioned Eleanor Roosevelt a few minutes ago and said that you had the opportunity to chauffeur her. Around. Yeah, she she uh, we brought her. Uh, she was there in the fall uh, of forty two, I believe. And, winter 42 and she got out of my car and uh, she went over to the troops that was lined up and uh, some of the sailors she pulled up their britches and they says these men need thicker socks and less cigarettes <laughs> and, uh, they will forget Eleanor she always said what she, she thought she didn't care uh, about who was around or anything else she spoke her piece but she was a great old lady she really was, and uh, but they had a lot of lot of uh, experiences we had in Ireland. But I didn't see much of the war, uh, you know, because uh, they didn't they didn't hit Ireland uh -huh. uh, once. I think once or twice they they uh, dive bombers came into Londonderry, but we had so many fast jets after them. The, uh, not jets, but uh, didn't have jets back then, but. Uh, had some Mustang P-51s that uh, on the naval base there, that uh, in the army base, that uh, the Germans didn't mess with <laughs> with us over there much. But uh, they hit uh, England, and of course I go to England, and Scotland, and places like that mm -hmm. on leave, you know, a lot of times. But I always of all the places that I traveled throughout the world, and I told Evelyn. I said, honey, I said, I want to I want to go back to Ireland. And so I had a chance with Brother Stone and to go to see the missionaries over there that had been over there for the Randalls for many years. Went back in 2000. And, <coughs> and I always wanted to take Evelyn to Ireland, but she didn't get to go, but she did get to go to, to uh, uh, Israel. She always talked about Israel after she came back. She she always talked about Israel. That was one place that she was. She, she, she'd like to go back again. Mm -hmm. And of course Charles and my sister Evelyn, they made five, six trips a year over there, you know. They, that yeah. was their job. Uh -huh. Getting up groups and taking them. Evelyn and my sister Miriam went with uh, them, uh, Charles and Evelyn on their yeah. One of their tours over there. Wow. Ireland. Well, we're getting away from the war, but <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> um, I was gonna ask you let me see. Um, tell me about uh, when y'all uh got to Nagasaki, what y'all found and um what was the name of the place that you said that uh did it start with an O of a song? Uh, we, we, the, the big basin that we went in, the big naval base. Yeah. Well, there wasn't really anything to see at Nekasaki. It was just desolate. Tell me about the people and what all happened. We, we, we were just on a ship and we couldn't see anything much, you know, except jaggered metal and it was just wiped. The city was just wiped out. It, it was just, there wasn't nothing there, just jaggered metal. And, all that, and I don't know. They see this is a week after the, and, and of course the, the, they're still doing cleanup and all that. But uh, around there, but and it was real desolate, you know. Uh, probably a lot of even a week later, they they didn't have all of the people, you know, uh, that were dead. They they killed thousands, you know, two, I think over two hundred thousand between the two cities. Yeah, it was killed, but. Uh, that was the end. The, the Japanese didn't want no more war after that. That was that ended it. 
Where did you go in that you saw the people? Where was that at? You had told me before about... Um, well, when we went into Sasebo, of course, Sesebu. there wasn't any... Yeah. That was the largest naval base in, in uh, one of the largest in the world. And they had cranes there that would lift 300 tons. And they would lift those small two-man subs over in the water. They didn't have to launch them like you would a ship. They just, they just lift them over with them big cranes, and they were building uh, hundreds of those things when, when we went in there. And uh, But they were a lot like the kamikazes. Uh, they, that was a uh, operation that they got into that cost them so much, mm -hmm. but it, they, they weren't successful with them. And uh, just like the kamikazes, they thousands of them, that, that those men that they uh, sent to, to Okinawa, and our ship shot down a couple. All they had to do is, is hit, hit them with uh, machine gun fire and they'd explode because they were all explosion, you know, they're just a like a flying bomb. And the man knew he wasn't coming back, and he didn't have to learn. Some of them didn't have six, eight hours of experience as a pilot, because uh, all they did, they didn't have to learn to land. All they had to learn to take off. <laughs> and from there on, they were trying to hit our ships, but they were trying to hit the big battle wagons. And, and uh, so uh, they, uh, they weren't uh, trying to hit ships like my sh the ship that I was on, but they'd fly over us and we'd, uh, we'd, we'd shoot at them. <laughs> and, uh, so that, but they were hundreds of them. But the, of all the thousands of them things that they had, uh, they wasn't even 2% of them that, that did damage. So that was a situation there where they, they just, that was a big failure really. And the Japanese, they lost a lot of people unnecessary and uh, didn't, weren't effective. You know. uh -huh. They thought it would be, but they, they couldn't get through the, the all the fire in the ships. Mm -hmm. They had to come in low enough, you know, to try to fly into the battle wagons. Yeah. And it's 12 o'clock now. It's 11.30. Huh? It's just oh, it's just eleven thirty. Oh, excuse yeah. me, I thought that's I heard. okay. Yeah. Um, tell me about the people that you saw when you got to Japan. The situation with the the people there. Well, we didn't see any people when we got in. There was five thousand Japanese per square mile, and there wasn't a one to be seen. We made the invasion just like a regular invasion, just like they made the Normandy invasion, but the Marines went in, and and uh, they went in. Uh, in, in the particular place that the ship that we was on, you see, they were just, uh, that was mostly uh, industrial areas. And uh, so uh, there was one section over there of the big basin that wasn't nothing over there. It's just a hill, and just hills. And, and uh, but uh, over in the shipyards, while they had us, I was on a fireboat patrol, patrolling uh, around to keep any fires from starting because with all our ships there we couldn't afford to take a chance on any ship and then there were little channels that went back up into the city just just like streets only they were channels of water that people went in on their sand pans and so along about 10 11 o'clock while they start kind of sticking their heads out the, the Japanese and they saw we wasn't going to shoot them and uh, so uh, I, I saw uh, a little smoke coming out of a little uh, cabin. It was just a little shack over on there, and, and I could see with my binoculars uh, that it, it was about four or five miles across the bay there, you know. So I, I radioed my command ship that I was going over to investigate this fire. <laughs> we see the smoke coming out of this little building, and went over there. So I was kidding with the boys. I said, now, fellas, I said, I'm going to kick the door open when I go up there in that shack. I said, I go in. If I don't come out, I said, you just riddle it with machine gun. 
and uh, kicked the door open. There was three little Japanese just starving to death eating rats. They had rats in a pan. They hadn't even took the hair off of skin. They just frying them, you know. And uh, they would eat anything they could find because the civilians were starving. They didn't get any food. And, and uh, so I came out and told one of the seamen to bring me a case of sea rations. We had several cases of sea rations in case we got separated from our ship. We always had food, you know. Yeah. So I says, bring me a case of sea rations. They probably weigh about 20 something pounds. Lord, there's a lot of food in there. There's all kind of food. Of course, the case was covered with cosmoline, you know, and we had to cut it open and get in there. And I motioned them to come out, and they couldn't wait for me to get the box open. And uh, so we uh, we went ahead. And, uh, one of the other boys helped me, and, and we and he said they might founder them. He says they're not eating anything like that. Says they might kill them. I now they'll be all right. So, oh, they were digging into that food, you know, and, and uh, they had chocolate bars and all that in 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 the in the uh, sea rations, you know, a lot of good little things and uh, puddings and things like that, you know. And uh, we showed them how to open them, and uh, so I left the whole box with them, the three of them. They were having a ball, when it, but they couldn't speak. English and I couldn't speak Japanese, but they were bowing and thanking us, you know. The little guys, they were starving to death. And so we went up through some of the channels and some of the girls would tell us to get over, come over on their sand pan, you know. And the old boy said, let me off, one of them, you know, one of our men, and said, I, you all pick me up on the way back. I said, Lord, I said, you never know what them girls might give you when they got it. He said, well, they give me. He said, they, they, they had leprosy. <laughs> I reckon he'd had everything but leprosy. <laughs> but he, uh, I said, no. I said, you never know. This life will stab you in the back. You don't know what them Japs are going to do. We knew how treacherous and mean they were though, to our men, you know, our prisoners, and the, the horrible atrocities that that our men suffered under the Japanese. Us people here in America, 90% of them will never know all the horrible things went on. So we didn't trust the Japanese too too much right at that time. But the fight had been taken out of them. As I say, the civilians were starving and the military was getting all the food, you know. And they sure wasn't giving it to our prisoners. They had to get out and scrounge around eat anything they could find, you know. They'd give them a little rice each day when we went in there and, and uh, some of the prison camps and our men went in and, and got them out, you know. Tell me about, um, you were telling me the other day, about, is Sesebu, is that the name of the place where you were at? Sesebu, yeah. Yeah, Sesebu. You said when y'all got there, y'all saw like heaps of metal Oh yeah, they, they they during all during the thirties they went all over America. They came. I remember in Virginia when I was a kid, they came and, and bought scrap metal from us. All that metal went overseas. The old bedsteads and uh, these were the Japanese stuff. that did yeah. that. And uh, they were they they were it was piled as high as a ten. 10 store building all for a mile along there and they melted down. And the big founders, they had some of the biggest founders in the world there and they'd melt it down. They was making, you know, different things, you know, all different kind of metal. They'd make guns and ammunition and, and all kind of things with with that metal. And I guess and, Okay. It was some of it was scrap iron, some steel, and it was just uh, they just poured all together, and, and it'd come out some kind of steel, you know. But uh, uh, old wheels of uh, rakes and mm -hmm. things like that, <coughs> bedsteads, and, and uh, I, so I like, got I got a lot of stuff together.